Welcome to two of the most influential women of their generation, Greta Thunberg, who motivated not only a whole generation of children, but also politicians and industry leaders, and just basically everyone to take climate emer the climate emergency seriously. And uh, Luisa Neubauer, one of the most prominent climate activists in Germany, part of the Fridays for Future movement as well. And she's a columnist, podcaster, book author, and just finished her studies last year in geography. And she may or may not become a politician in the future. So we we'll talk about that later. So one year ago, we all met in Davos. I remember very well, you have been there for the first time. And I had the feeling that um, the CEOs there and the politicians were really impressed, talking seriously about climate change. And they lots of talks about CEOs telling you stories about their children and stuff like that. And um, so one year later, what's your view on, on this? Um, if you look back, did concerning climate change, anything substantially positive happen in the last 12 months? Open question for the two of you. Well, of course, there are always many positive things happening all the time. Um, we are, I mean, things are happening all the time. We are not saying that nothing is happening and that no one is doing anything. Of course, things are, things are happening all the time. But if you look at it from a broader perspective, from a holistic point of view, which we need to, then you can see that the changes necessary for us to stay in line with our targets to if we are to live up to our promises that world leaders signed in Paris Agreement, in the Paris agreement, then um, those changes are nowhere to be seen today. And the level of awareness needed for us to achieve those changes is nowhere to be seen. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think it's uh, as a question of um, timing of speed. So the, the climate destruction, the ecological breakdown is just, you know, moving on so fast. So even if there are small steps happening, they're too slow and too small. Um, which is which is a difficult you know situation to handle. It's easy to get really demotivated by that, um, and it's um, easy to just you know claim everything to be doomed already. Um, I do think there were some, in a sense, significant changes happening in the political landscape. So it was very um, well to say the least unfortunate to have a U.S. president who didn't believe in any kind of basic science. And the fact that that changed is obviously not, you know, making a difference on an emission level and doesn't promise anything in terms of, you know, climate action. But there might be, you know, more of a foundation to do anything on. Mm. So I, I, I registered at least one interesting sign. So I, uh, Luisa, I think you mentioned that also. So Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, he's writing an annual letter to in, so global investors. And he noted that um, so the investments change to write uh, so to sustainable assets uh, quite a bit. So a 96% increase over uh, uh, in 220 uh, compared to 219. So th should this be a sign of hope? Is this what we need? So the financial community reacting? Well, um, I mean, you know, considering BlackRock is the largest investor in coal infrastructure worldwide, you know, mm. putting that aside, it's, uh, we, we see similar dynamics as the ones that we just described. So basically, you know, finance worldwide is working towards a climate breakdown. It is, um, you know, growing on more and more climate destruction and a dead forest is worth more than an like living forest you know that it's a system that is so twisted and broken in so many ways and um so you know the idea of introducing um and implementing maybe a sustainable fund while the destruction keeps going is in a sense a bit of an irony i assume and mm. i mean the idea eventually to fully divest from fossil fuel that obviously is needed very much um yet right now we see that our carbon budget is you know shrinking um the minute we speak and uh, what we would need would be a full divestment um it would be a full withdrawal from any kind of investments um and um, insurances from fossil fuel infrastructure, yet that keeps rising too. So it's, um, 
yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm not too uh, joyful about um, mm. yeah that right now. Actually, something rather unexpected happened in the last 12 months, uh, which is a global pandemic. And I, I wanted f uh, to know from you what you can learn from it um, uh, for the mission of Fridays for Future. You have been asked that a lot, but now we have, so we are um, one year into the pandemic almost. And there's one, for me at least, depressing fact, Greta, that I wanted to talk with you about. If I believe what the experts of the World Meteorological Organization tell me, so the global concentration of greenhouse gases continued to rise. It didn't, it just didn't fall. Everyone so, so, uh, stopped traveling, uh, industry consumption uh, went down, but we, we didn't see a major effect on this. Isn't that kind of a de depressing situation? Well, first of all, we need to separate uh, increase of uh, the CO2 that we emit and the increase in concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Which one do you mean? You mentioned, you talked about both. Uh, uh, the, the concentration, sorry. The so concentration. I, I'm aware of the fact that we had a reduction, but the, the effect on, on, on the global climate seemed to be minimal and was, um, was due to carbon sinks compensated as far as I got it. Yeah, so the, the rise in, yeah. Um, and yes, of course, and that, that only, I mean, it's, I'm not surprised. I'm surprised that people are surprised. Um, but this just uh, once again show that, that we cannot rely fully on, uh, on nature to, to compensate for us. And this just puts the, the term net zero emissions into a whole new perspective. Uh, and, um, and if, if I'm surprised that the emissions reduced so, so little, uh, then of course not. The measures taken during the corona pandemic are nothing similar to what climate action would look like. And we must not uh, confuse these two, these two very different things. So, um, so, I mean, it doesn't show us and basically that much. It just shows what we already knew. We know that if we would take action uh, to fight the climate crisis, then that would be a whole different story, but that's not what we did right now. Mm. At least we saw that people were able to stop traveling uh, uh, on a global scale. Do you think we, we can motivate people all around the world to do not start again when the pandemic is over? Uh, of course not. Uh, as long as we don't treat the climate crisis like a crisis, then uh, we won't be able to, then, I mean, people won't understand that we are in a crisis. And, and also some people make it seem like the corona pandemic was something positive for the climate or that mm. we can learn from this and that uh, this shows that we can take action, which of course is not true. Like I said, we cannot confuse these two very different crises. And um, this is, this is, nothing to do with climate action and this is not how it should be done how it can be done i mm. think we have seen by the effects of this that mm. this cannot be the case mm. so Luisa, Luisa, what would you think well um two things i mean first of all maybe the idea that you know we are going to solve any climate crisis just by the side because we have to, you know, slow down industries for some months, you know, maybe symbolizes a bit how people, you know, are still misunderstanding what climate action actually means and how we speak of like transformative and transformational changes of systemic changes that last for a long time that are implemented in a, you know, just and sustainable way. And I mean, that is, you know, uh, Greta just highlighted that uh, we people took very short sighted and um, very prompt, um, you know, quick fixing action in terms of the Corona crisis, which had nothing to do with like a climate uh, motivation behind it, any kind of, you know, thinking about how can we uh, solve sustainability crisis by this side, because people were focused on the pandemic that we need to kind of, you know, deal with, obviously, um, for many mm. reasons. Mm. And um, I feel what you know, there, there's one aspect to, to the 
to the two crises that is barely discussed, but that is obviously, you know, a huge issue and more and more scientists at least publish papers to it, give talks about it, is that also obviously um, the likelihood of pandemics um, breaking out in the first place just rises the more nature is destroyed, the further um, the climate changes and so on. People can adapt to a new climate, but um, most other species cannot. So um, what this also is, in a sense, a symptom of a cumulative breakdown of a number of like e ecological um, systems that we are just taking apart. And you you looked at the CO2 levels um, in terms of Corona, and yet we, I think, need to understand that the climate crisis isn't just an issue of CO2, but it's an issue of, you know, an, a, a very complex ecological breakdown that we are, you know, forcing um, upon the world, upon ourselves, kind of everywhere we go, uh, taking mm. apart basically everything we need to live. Yeah, and just like you said, I mean, uh, in the aftermath of the corona pandemic, of course, it's it's far from over, but we are starting to talk that we, we want a green recovery or we want a sustainable recovery. And the people say like, just the fact that people think that we can solve the climate crisis just like that while um, while trying to fix another issue, just like um, it sort of happened to be solved, that just shows that we haven't understood the climate crisis. And that just shows that the, the, the misconception that is out there. Mm. At least you can learn that. So I have the feeling so that many, many things changed in our lives. So we do not travel anymore. We, we reduce consumption and stuff like that. And compared to the things ahead, if we want to change um, um, this planet, they are obviously kind of tiny, right? Do you feel so? There's a lot of investment programs around the world. So every country, the EU, the US, Germany, every country has a major investment package on its way. Do you fear that we will see rather a major rebound to, to when it comes to climate change? So industrial production going up in a way we haven't seen that before. Well, it is possible at least and even you know that fact is somewhat sad so it's not off the table i would say um because um there used to be a lot of talking about you know what what Greta mentioned green recovery and you know sustainable um crisis management yet um right now what we see is that um the patience in a sense is gone and um, there's a lot of thriving for just everything to be in a sense normal which we know was you know um, a crisis itself um, so I think there's rather the, the striving to create some some sort of stable environment and um, by environment I, I, I you know societal environments and um, mm -hmm. economic and, um, environments and um, I feel in a sense, it's irritating, of course, because what the corona pandemic has shown how bad governments are or how difficult it seems to be for governments to do, not to focus on different crises at the same time. So as soon as corona, you know, came through the door, the climate crisis kind of went out of the window when it comes to, you know, resource allocation, the energy that was spent on, you know, just even discussing crises without acting. And you would... Um, you would think that governments use this situation to maybe not fuel one crisis while trying to overcome the other. But effectively, mm. I mean, it's likely that just that will happen. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as long as we don't fully understand the climate crisis, as long as we don't treat it like a crisis, of course, we won't be able to change anything. Um, of course, we will just go back to, to normal, which was, of course, also a crisis. Um, because there's no reason not to. Since the climate crisis doesn't exist, there's no reason why we should take action. There's no reason why we shouldn't even boost even more, even manufacture even more to compensate for, for the lost months that we've had now, because the climate crisis doesn't exist. And as long as it's like that, no real changes will be achieved. Mm -hmm. Greta, you talked to many, many uh, chiefs of state in the last 
two years, I would say, do you have the feeling that they are, do you have, maybe it's a strange question, but do you have the feeling that they are serious about climate change? I mean, they say they are, but uh, I think that, uh, of course, actions speak louder than words. And you don't need me saying that uh, uh, their actions don't live up to their words. I think you can clearly see that for yourself. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't really think I need to say anything more about that. Mm. So, when I look how you think as, Fr as the Fridays for Future uh, movement, you look for the num so actual numbers, do they change or don't they change? What, what actions do we really take to change something? Why do you meet politicians at all? So isn't it just, do you, don't you fear that they just use you as a PR um, thing? Isn't that a danger? Of course, they only meet us for the selfies. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt about that. They aren't. <laughs> uh, if, if that wasn't the case, then they would have taken action by now. But um, that can't be a reason not to do anything. You can't think that everything everything is um, just uh, lost anyway. We can't do anything. And there's no point. If you think like that, then, I mean, that's not very healthy. You must mm. always do everything you can, take every possible action that you can. And uh, that is what we are doing, um, using our platforms and our voices to use every possibility that we get to try to make mm. a difference. People say that we are pessimistic and that we we are alarmists and doomish, but uh, it's quite the opposite because we are we are the ones. People like I mean, activists are the ones who are really doing something, and for that you need to be very optimistic to be able to think that you can actually change something. Mm. Because we do, we can change things. Uh, it's just gonna take a bit of time and lots of effort. <laughs> mm. And I, I, after, I, I think after all, we are, you know, people are trying to put us in a, you know, anti-democratic corner. Um, and uh, after all, you know, there's also a reason that dialogue is part of um, democracy. And I oftentimes feel that leaders try to meet us to consider that to be enough action in terms of, you know, <laughs> climate change. Um, and they confuse, you know, talking with action a bit. Um, but obviously, uh, we can at least make sure that while we talk, uh, they don't understand this to be their opting out, um, you know, event. Okay, just let me read out some of the Slido questions coming in. So there are thousands of people listening to uh, live. So Sarah Listner, Sarah Listner is asking, what are your experiences as young women with respect to being taken seriously or not? by people in influential positions. Do you have advice for young women everywhere? So question from both of you. Uh, don't let them stop you. I mean, uh, I feel like some sometimes it's confusing for older um, people, maybe <laughs> sometimes even men, if you know they have to suddenly speak to young women, which maybe for a long time didn't happen that much. But um, time is changing and uh, we just go along and I feel um, if anything, I hope it's easier for every other young woman to kind of speak out now and to kind of get started and to not, you know, to lose um, any kind of anxiety, um, you know, speaking truth to power and standing up for your rights and for a just world. Yes. And us speaking up like this would not have been possible uh, uh, without the the other young women before us who who um, who broke these um, sort of norms or how you say in English uh, who uh, who stepped out and dared to to stand out um, and we are of course very grateful for that but of course we we still have a way to go uh, and. Uh, yeah, I just agree with what you said, Louisa. Don't let that stop you. And we need people to speak up today. We can't, we need every single one to speak up. So 
don't let them stop you. Maybe another strange question when we talk about young women leading this Fridays for Future movement. I remember very well uh, seeing you in Davos and all the, the women uh, in the news. And I remember very well there were guys working in the back end. So this, this was really impressive to see that. Why is that so? Why is Friday? So from, from an outside view, Fridays for Future seems to be like a women's movement in public sometime. Why is that so? Well, I, you know, obviously, um, as soon as you take a closer look, you see that there's actually, you know, um, that there are a range of genders uh, represented or like part of Fridays for Future. And of course, everyone is needed and invited. Um, I feel that, you know, does definitely make a difference that people see maybe um, a lot of, you know, young women in the media and then kind of decide that this may be a place where they want to get active too. So I think that has definitely an effect. Um, but also sometimes we actually, you know, I sometimes also feel that um, there is this uh, picture in the hands of many that various features, mm. you know, just, you know, very woman based, but that is actually, you know, not you know, so close to, to the reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, of course it's that um, portrait isn't 100% correct. Um, there may be more women involved in the Fridays for Future movement. And uh, that of course may have many explanations behind, but honestly, I don't, I don't really care. I just want everyone to be involved and <laughs> I don't I don't spend time speculating about why that may be the case. Um, mm. we we are too busy organizing. <laughs> okay. I have another question from the audience. Um, a question I have myself, so wonderful. Thank you. Um, Kai Gondlach is asking, how do you plan to continue keeping up the pressure on the political establishment other than joining established political parties? Are there plans of founding your own or cooperate with others? What's your roadmap? Great question. So Greta, will you found a party? Uh, as it looks like now, no, because the solutions needed are cannot be reduced to party politics. What is needed now is a massive race in awareness and uh, sort of just for us to, the public to become aware of where we are at the crisis that we face right now and um, that you cannot achieve with with party politics uh, something much bigger is needed at the moment i'm not saying that we won't do that in the future maybe th then it will be relevant but um as it is now no that is not my plan uh, louisa what about you yeah, I can just agree. It's, uh, you know, it's also maybe the try to, you know, reduce the climate crisis to something that, you know, that is in a sense more understandable, uh, more handy, like a party, like an institution, like a, a whatever like economic institution or so on and um, but since changes yeah and just need everywhere what we need is like institutions all over the place or kind of parties or kind of you know governments whatever to hmm. um to change and to be part of the the positive change and um, the change is needed so so desperately um and obviously there's uh, there's a, a need for parties across the globe to, to to understand themselves as you know uh, parties that are concerned with the climate crisis like a lot of the times you know um, in the political spectrum we see this in Germany a lot um, the climate crisis is reduced to some kind of ecological party and they can deal with that and everyone else can do like the mm. real politics I feel like there's mm. a lot of misconception as well um, mm. but yeah uh, I come to back to that later, maybe, because uh, German politics is quite interesting at the moment uh, when it comes to Fridays for Future. But um, since Greta has to leave us after approximately 30 minutes, and I promised I, I say when that will be, um, another question from the audience. Um, 
I don't have to leave after 30 minutes. Oh, cool. So big news. So stay with us. Um, so I, no, but I, I read the question anyway. Greta and Lu so Birgit uh, Bortoluzzi is, is asking, Greta and Luisa, what do you think would be the greatest lever for reduction of emission? Which is a great question, but... I'm sorry, the greatest lever... So what, what would be the, the, the best way of... Uh, so the, what would have a maximum effect on uh, the reduction of emissions? What would you think? Like I always said, if if we started to treat the crisis like a crisis, that would lead to us taking action. In the, and we don't know exactly how that action would look like. If we did, then this wouldn't be a crisis. It would just be like a button to press. Uh, so no one knows, of course. Uh, there are, I mean, the, because there's so much that needs to be done. There's no one silver bullet that will solve everything. It is all the, the collective actions that um, accumulated will 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 be what we need and mm. achieve that we need to achieve awareness. Mm. So awareness is the thing that will bring the most change because mm. that will lead to the changes. And that there, so, there are some ideas out there. I mean, yeah. you know, it is quite common knowledge, you know, where are the largest, you know, man-made sources of emission in terms of what kind of energy has been used and how and how much. And, you know, why is it transported across the globe and so on. So I think, um, you know, as soon as you like, as you decide to do something, I mean, there's everywhere you find, you know, ways to start. But I think, um, you know, we're being asked a lot, like three things everyone can do to, you know, to solve climate change. And, you know, there are lots of questions kind of hinting towards that idea that actually there's a plan out there and we just need to find it and we just do it. Um, but, you know, no country in the world, no continent in the world has ever, you know, turned into kind of a climate justice, say, Germany or democracy or EU, like there is no, nobody knows what this looks like. This transformation has never been happening before. So what we need basically is people collectively decide we want to do that and then, you know, figure out the most sustainable and just way to do it. Um, mm. And um, not wait for this kind of plan to be presented and say, oh, once, you know, you give it to us, then we might choose it or maybe may not because, you know, we decide something else will be more important then. Okay. And when we, when we think about climate change, the climate crisis, I mean, and, and the, the so-called bad guys, so we think of like oil companies and fossil fuel companies and car companies and, and, and so on. Um, and that is, of course, very true. But let's not also forget um, forestry. I mean, land use, agriculture, that is, all, that is also a crucial part of this that cannot be left out, both when it comes to the climate crisis, but also the ecological crisis, the loss of biodiversity crisis, and so on. Hmm. Let's not forget about them as well. We need to see this from a holistic point of view. Hmm. Today so the, is the, the International Day of Wetlands, by the way. Is it? It oh. is. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the well, the de depressing fact, at least for ordinary people like me, is that I learned that it's it's totally unimportant if I stop flying or go vegan or whatever because the the effect is so tiny. I know you are aware of this debate. But obviously, we need a system change to change the world fund fundamentally. This is what you're saying all the time. So how should this, we obviously also need a political revolution to change things. So how should that look like? How's that working out at the moment for you? First of all, thank you for the question. Maybe you want to write about it in the newspaper that you edit. Um, I think people <laughs> should also hear it from you. Um, not just from We're writing angry this young all woman. the time, and I know it's it's a, a complicated matter, and you can do something as an individual. But so, how what what would you think? How should we change uh, to get this thing done? I mean, if if we zoom out a bit and see, like, okay, what what do we need now? We we are fortunate enough to live in democracies, and um, in a democracy. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, your are... dogs. Yes. <laughs> Greetings. Uh, yes. <laughs> they say hi. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, in a democracy, the people are the ones who have the power. It is public opinion that runs the free world. Uh, thank God for that. Uh, so what do we need? We need, okay, we need pressure from people. We need people to to say to politicians and the people in power that you need to do this um, because otherwise those changes won't happen. And in order to create that, to build on that critical mass of people, we need awareness and we need to shift the social norm. We need to, to create like some kind of um, social revolution or whatever you would call it. And how do you do that? By people leading the way, by changing your the way we see the world by changing the way that we behave, changing the way that we perceive and talk about this crisis. So we say that individual changes don't mean anything. Well, of course, if you look at it in that way, I'm autistic, so I do. <laughs> I look in numbers too much. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've learned not to. So if you look at if one person stops flying, then uh, that will send a signal to the people around that person that okay, mm. something is wrong. Why is this person changing their habits? This is a very strange thing to do. And when I stopped flying and when I, I mean, I didn't sail across the Atlantic Ocean because I wanted to lower my carbon footprint. I did it to create awareness and to sort of create a debate for people to start talking and thinking about, okay, some, why is she doing this? Something is wrong. Um, those people are, who are starting to think like that, they are also, maybe they also change their behavior and that spreads to more people, that spreads to more people. And um, suddenly you have created some kind of movement or some kind of shift in the narrative. And that is what we need right now. Mm. So um, and also, yeah. buying and doing, becoming vegan is not um, useless. We need, mm. yes, we need a system change, but we can't achieve system change without individual change, without people realizing that we are in a crisis. And also, I think the question of like individual behavior change is often reducing people to the role as a consumer. So, you know, we are, you know, people are consumers at, you know, half an hour a day when they like wander around and you kind of you know, place to find something to eat or so. But most of the time, people aren't actually consuming, you know, goods, but they are, uh, you know, first of all, they are political beings, they are political voices, at least they have technically a political <laughs> voice. They are social beings, they are friends, they are moms, they are parents, they are editors, they are, you know, running companies or, you know, working with colleagues, they are, you know, living in specific kind of environments. So, you know, there's, there isn't just this one role that everyone has and, you know, this one thing you can make out of this role. It's, you know, very, very successful narrative reducing people to the power they have as a consumer while actually, you know, there's so much more to do. And Fridays for Future grew because many people made a very, very personal, private decision in terms on, on a Friday morning, they decided today I want to make a difference. And they realized one Friday morning, actually, I'm not just, I don't just matter when I'm in a supermarket, but I matter when I'm on the streets, when I decide to go out and, you know, change my ways. Mm. And um, that is actually something that is, um, that is, you know, demonstrates in a very, very, I think, um, you know, visible way, uh, how how one thing can lead to the other and um, how it is effective. Eventually what we need is large movements and large movements, you know, they come together when very many people make a seemingly small decision. And what I think, you know, when we think about coming back to your question, you know, what is needed now, I think a lot of the things that um, are often missing is this understanding of scaling. So scaling up one thing that you know, don't just do by yourself, but in a group that is growing. And that mm. has to do with organizing that effectively is just Fridays for Future organizing, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who each do one single collect, like one single action by themselves, which turns into a collective movement when it's organized, when it's, you know, um, coming together, channeling um, on mm. a channel on a specific day. Um, Greta, you were mentioned democracy. So I, I would be really interested in your view on China. Um, you have a, a strong base in many countries, but obviously it's uh, really complicated to be a, a Fridays for Future member in China. I'm aware of one person there who is famous now, uh, Owe O, who is demonstrating as, as one a female person doing this all day. 
Um, and what we see there is rather the opposite, something like a revolution uh, top down. So Xi Jinping announcing to be carbon neutral 2060. How do you see this? Well, I mean, yes, of course, it's it's um, like you said, there's one person there. Uh, I mean, of course, there are several, but uh, sorry. Yeah, I, it just I was joking. It's it's the only person we are aware of. She's, yeah, I she's know. How one famous girl, but I, I'm sure there are millions sympathizing with you. But it's really hard to step out and say something. Yeah, how are you? Oh, she is. Uh, she's incredible. Uh, she's so brave, and I mean, we are also so grateful for everything that she's doing, and that really puts it into a different perspective. That we, uh, the privileged ones, who who actually can protest and who can do these things without actually endangering something for real. Um, I mean, that just puts more responsibility to us that we we need to to do much more, and um, and of course we we won't be able to. We can't do this without democracy. We can't do this without free press, without um, freedom of speech, and and etc. That is just not possible. Mm. And this really shows that. Mm. Um, Howie is actually in Berlin right now, and I met her last week. Um, she is, um, you know, she actually came to learn about uh, organizing, um, and it was actually a very, um, it was a very, you know. Um, standing like first person in person uh, meeting with her because she was you know she was grateful to be there but she was also very confused because she said Louisa you're like you're so privileged I was gonna say you're so privileged here you live in a democracy you live in a you know in a free country and there is still no you know um you know climate revolution whatever there's still no like large huge societal shift happening like what is hmm. what is happening here? You could you could be doing it. Why is it such an? Uh, why is this so? Um, yeah. Why is it so quiet here? Is what she said, and hmm. um, and she actually put a sign saying <laughs> you're privileged, and which I think is a it's a very she's very right saying that, and she has every right to say that, um, hmm. and um, yeah. So actually, that is um, what we need. Is I mean. There was, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, no democracy has ever turned into a climate justice democracy. Um, yet, I mean, how beautiful would that be if democracies kind of came together um, to do that, to accomplish just that and to turn into kind of, you know, truly just um, democracy, not in, in the present, but also, you know, intergenerationally. Hmm. But how do you see it? So Xi Jinping announcing we will be carbon neutral 2060. So it kind of... Um, a top-down approach to do this, I would assume. Maybe it's the more effective way to do these things. Never. Never. No, and you... also, no, this is not just about effectiveness, but this is also about rights. I mean, we are a climate justice movement, um, so there's a justice is aspect to that. Yeah. You cannot have climate justice without having fundamental human rights. Okay, I read another question from the Have audience. All the rights, all the human rights. We mm. they they are supposed to. Can you understand? Me? Oh, I think my. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I think the you know it, this is not just about reducing emission uh, on like whatever price or whatever you know tag but it is about you know justice effectively i mean solving the climate crisis or like overcoming managing the climate crisis also you know deep down it's not it's not you know why should we care about the climate in the first place why shouldn't we you know especially those who are like privileged who don't you know have to suffer every day why should we care in the first place and um, this is about justice this is about you know um justice everywhere um no matter where people are then no matter what generation they're from or so. Hmm. There's another question from the audience asking the system question. So I read it out. So Udo Wenzel says, uh, what do you think? Can we solve the climate crisis within the system capitalism? I mean, it's completely irrelevant what, what we think. I mean, our opinions. No, it's not. Are Yes, it, it's not interesting what a, what a schoolgirl from Sweden thinks about politics. This is about science. 
Um, and I mean, when we say we cannot solve this within our current uh, systems, then we're not talking about politics, we're not talking about capitalism. I mean, we're just, if you look through the current best available science, you see that, I mean, the production gap, the planned production of, of, um, of fossil fuels by the year 2030 accounts for more than 100, for 120 percent more than what would be consistent with the 1.5 degree targets and uh, then you, you look at that and say okay so what does that what does that actually translate to that means that if we are to stay below these safety levels to have the best odds of avoiding uh, passing so-called tipping points and feedback loops that uh, will many will be irreversible and um, then that means that we need to to abandon contracts and tear up contracts and valid deals um, if we are to to achieve that so to speak and uh, I mean that would be on a scale that we can't imagine and I'm not saying we should do it I'm just saying if we are to, to achieve this then that is what we need to do um, and that is that is not possible within today's uh, systems and uh, so it's not an opinion it's just Man. one plus one equals two Hmm. And I, I mean, adding to that, I feel um, obviously, you know, we're being asked about capitalism so much. And I oftentimes feel it's, you know, for people just wanting us to say something, you know, against whatever capitalist logic to then claim us to be some kind of, you know, whatever um, alternative people imagine that to be. And, you know, that also I feel like is... Um, to say the least, a strategy to reduce the most existential crisis of the world to a question of, you know, headlines and buzzwords and uh, titles. Um, and I mean, adding to what, what Greta hinted on with the production gap report, I feel, you know, that the same accounts for the way we think about growth. And that is not, you know, about our opinions, but that is just, you know, looking at the way societies have been growing over the, um, you know, in terms of the resources used and, uh, uh, you know, the, the amount of land and ecosystems degraded, um, you know, it doesn't add up anymore, simply. Um, it doesn't, you know, it, 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 it effectively on the long term and even in the short term actually doesn't uh, work out. Mm. And people, people are so obsessed talking about uh, growth and money. I mean, and saying that... Uh, we can have green growth, we cannot have green growth. I mean, that doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, if we can have green growth, then that will be great. If, if not, then, I mean, that's not the focus. That not, We need to remove the focus from this to actually people and planet. Stop thinking in money. If, if we can have green growth, then that would be great. I'm not against that. But if we can't, then we need to shift our priorities. That's what this is about. This is not about money. This is not about growth. This is a question about people and humans and uh, the planet and um, future living conditions, future generations. It's not about, it's not a question about money. We talk, we need to, we say that if we, if we save the, if we, avoid the worst consequence of the climate crisis, then we would save lots of money. And yeah, that's great. But that's mainly not our main priority. That's mm. uh, maybe not why we're doing it in the first place. Um, mm. Not to say that, that that isn't a good thing, but I mean, that should not be what motivates us. Mm. And it's understandable that I feel like oftentimes this question of can we still have this and can we still have that is also a sign of people feeling like they're losing something like through us in a twisted way, but also through climate mitigation, through climate action, they would be losing something like, um, you know, their, I don't know, <laughs> uh, favorite capitalist system or their, their, the car they would want to have or whatever. I think there's a, a large sense, like a collective sense of, you know, um, you know, they are wanting to take something away from us. And this actually tells a story about how we talk about the climate crisis. Um, you know, we are we are in a crisis that is taking away from us 
um, rights, um, freedom to live on a safe planet. That is taking away that, you know, we're taking away our, you know, ecosystems from ourselves in a sense. We are taking away our perspective to grow old on a planet that is inhabitable. So actually it is a climate crisis threatening us and, you know, taking away so, so, so much from us. And it is by, you know, tackling the climate crisis, it's actually climate action that is, you know, able to, to give back in a sense. It's, you know, this notion of actually people having or being able um, to employ their rights um, for as long as they live for wherever they are. Mm. Mm. May I come back to the politics part of our discussion earlier? Um, I wanted to ask, especially Luisa, who's a member of the Green Party here in Germany. And as, so are you criticizing the Greens and every other politician all the time? But again, isn't it an important step to be part of the system to change something? Something we call the march through institutions. <laughs> so don't you need to be part of something? of the government one day to really make a change? Well, you know, when I joined them, that was in a different time when there was Brexit and Trump happening. And I wondered, what does it mean to be a young person in democracy? And there was no climate movement in a sense that I was about to join. And I felt, you know, it's a, you know, it's an institution that I think should do more work, but I'm not, you know, I don't have a job, I don't have anything, I'm not, you know, we are as far as the future, we are überparteilich, uh, and this is what I understand myself to be too. Um, and when it comes to, you know, institutional change, of course, we need institutions to change. Um, but I just doubt that this is everything that, for instance, Greta and me need to do, be part of every institutional change, be into every institution, you know, it, it kind of implies that there's only, you know, so and so many people that can be part of the change and everyone else just being left out. And I don't think that there is a lack of, you know, climate justice oriented young people or old people and older people in Germany, you know, wanting to change institutions, wanting to be part of institutional change. Yet what we need so desperately is this awareness growing in civil society, growing within the public, and this understanding that what we need is not just some institutions doing some, you know, little twists here and some new policies there, but actually, you know, large systemic and yeah, system changes. And to achieve that, um, what we need is, yeah, it's, it's the people coming together. And the three of us only have this conversation right now because people decided to not just go into an institution and fight for some new policy, but to, you know, because people started to strike at some point because people got inspired by the idea that what we need to do is actually bigger than uh, one institution and change. Mm. Yeah. You're really, yeah, Greta? Oh, sorry. I interrupted, but um, before I, I started striking, before we started striking, I mean, I was involved in many different organizations and tried to, to get my voice heard through there. And that wasn't very successful. Um, for one reason, because I'm, I'm so socially awkward and I don't function well with people, <laughs> but, uh, but also because, I mean, I saw that, I mean, that had already been done and that hadn't led to any to the sufficient changes to the sort of awareness in about the crisis that we need not to say that we i mean there are many people working from institutions who are doing great work and who we couldn't have made without um and i'm not saying that we we shouldn't have action from the institutions we need every possible action we can't exclude anything anymore we're not mm. we don't have that luxury anymore so we need every possible thing but we cannot believe that actions from governments or from political parties will be enough. Uh, like I explained earlier, we need a system change and um, we won't be able to solve the climate crisis without that system change, without pressure from outside. Mm. Um, but again, we need everything. And mm. I'm not, uh, saying that we can't have institutional action. When, when, Corona happened, when the pandemic started, many companies had major problems adapting to the new times when you can't travel and you have uh, to do everything digitally. And I had the feeling that Fridays for Future handled this from as an outsider uh, really gracefully. <laughs> can you uh, 
tell us a little bit about the daily work in a totally decentralized organization based on mainly digital means. How does that work? Yes, well, I mean, if uh, when you're a movement where basically no one flies, you need to be able to, <laughs> to communicate uh, despite that. So we already had like social platforms online where we could communicate. Uh, so, uh, but I mean, we have, we have clo very close contact and the, the, the best thing almost, one of the best things about the Fridays for Future movement is that it, it is so decentralized. It is such a grassroots movement and that uh, it isn't top down run. It's not an organization. We don't, we don't have any representatives, even though the media, media may frame it like that. But so everyone decides for themselves. So we just have like contacts um, through group chats where we organize mm -hmm. things and we have meetings online. These endless meetings online that I think people are very used to right now. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's sort of how we work. And it's interesting because before the Corona pandemic um, started um, in Germany, at um, at least we were like questioned so much about how our work around and people said, "Wait, you cannot do it without having a help quartier or a central or something like that." And people were very confused that we don't have like a large like institution, like some building, some manifesting, like something, you know, uh, something to walk into and still exist. And mm. um, so in a sense, and we, you know, we try to tell them that this is actually possible. And now I think um, many institutions are making similar experiences. Yet I feel it's also, you know, climate, if Rights of Future is also just, you know, people who are not just climate activists, but there are students, there are um, mothers, their daughters or siblings or, or um, whatever. So obviously um, there is a lot of struggle, of course, you know, just for, you know, getting around as a person in a pandemic and in many places which are less fortunate than Germany or Sweden. Um, this is actually something that is, you know, existential sometimes. So I feel, um, you know, uh, that is obviously also happening. Mm. And is caring about climate change, maybe it's also a strange question, but there's a discussion about this, isn't that a privilege in itself? So if you look, for example, the, the um, Yellow West movement in France, their claim was they are talking about the end of the world, we are talking about the end of the month. Um, so you know all this, but did that change or isn't it the same thing? So we have this privileged, sorry, young women and young men um, um, working on this, but uh, many, many other people on this planet have really different problems. Two things to that. A, of course, it's a privilege to be able to make the decision whether you want to get involved in climate action or not, because in many places around the world, people are hit by, clim by the climate crisis. They're confronted with it, whether they like it or not, whether they decide to or not. So, you know, when you're, you know, when your streets are being flooded, you don't wonder, you know, to wake up and say, do I want to confront myself today with the climate crisis or not? But it's just there and you have to act. So that is one aspect to that. Um, and so obviously we are very fortunate to be able to, you know, make this decision and in a weird society that kind of, you know, things it's, it's not much of a concern, we stand out also with now, obviously not anymore as much because we are many and uh, societies are changing. And then there's also the aspect to, you know, how do we talk about the climate crisis? And, you know, the climate crisis is considered to be this very, you know, privileged issue for people who have, you know, nothing else to care about, while it's a deeply unjust situation and also a societal injustice. So the question of social justice is so deeply connected to the climate crisis. I mean, who is it hitting the hardest? It's, a, it's the weakest, it's a, the least fortunate, it's the least privileged. And, you know, while um, when we look at, you know, who has, who can move away from, for instance, regions that are, you know, being hit with the climate crisis, it's not the least privileged, but it's the most privileged. So understanding the climate crisis as a social crisis helps so much to understand that actually, you know, reducing the climate crisis to an issue that is just for, you know, privileged people to care, care about, but real politics cares about something else, also just hugely misreads the character and the quality of the crisis. Hmm. I have four last questions for you, because we are coming to an end in the next minutes. Um, 
So maybe the strangest question I have, I'm not even sure if you're aware of the uh, this GameStop frenzy in the stock market going on these days. Oh, you are, okay. So for me, this is really interesting because for the first time as a lay person, when it comes to stocks, I really, I'm fascinated by what you can do as a crowd, which is decentralized uh, in economy. Do you think there's something for you? So why not buy, sorry guys, Siemens stocks, for example, and try to change uh, big companies from, from the inside as, as a shareholder? What do you think? That could be a method if someone was up for that. If someone, I don't feel like I'm the right person to do that. If someone would do that, I don't consider myself to have the knowledge of how stocks work. Um, and um, nor the time, nor the interest, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, but so yeah, I mean, like I said, we need every possible action. So if someone finds a way to do that, then I'm, and if it does more good than it does harm, then sure, that could be a thing. I wish so much for the person who just asked that, that, like, don't wait for us to do anything, but get started. Like, I feel like a lot of like good ideas are being carried to us. <laughs> and, you know, I think we are fairly busy, if I if I may say so. So I like, you know, people don't, you know, don't let anyone stop yourself, rock and roll. Actually, though, this shareholder, you know, organizing is actually is, is happening, at least in some places. So the Kritische Aktionäre, it's just called in Germany. Mm. So critical shareholders are actually doing something like this. This is by the way why um, some of us, I was speaking at RWE and at Deutsche Bank last uh, two years ago. And they actually, what they do is they buy shares and then they get the right to ask questions at the um, at the shareholder meetings, which can at least sometimes, you know, change something. Mm. Another last question, also very strange. Um, when you look through the eyes of the Fridays for Future movement, which only looks at numbers, do you think Fridays for Future is a success so far? Well, you cannot only just look at numbers. Um, <laughs> believe me, uh, I, like I said earlier, I am autistic and I've had to learn to not look too much on numbers, okay. not specify too much. So... Um, but I mean, you cannot, you, you need to look at this from a holistic point of view. You cannot see the world in numbers. The world is not black and white, even though I said like that in a speech. Of course, that was only a mm -hmm. metaphor. I didn't mean that literally. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, because we don't know what will happen. Um, this, of course, you, you can only achieve reduction in numbers you can only achieve change in numbers if you change people's mindsets so so yeah mm -hmm. okay and after all i feel you know the power and energy that has gone into this movement making it to what it is and that you know the the discourse of change that i reached i like obviously we value that so much we value every person that has you know put uh, time and effort into this that has joined us on the street. And I would say that coming from a like um, discursive side so the, 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 the way the, the climate crisis is perceived in the public eye, obviously things have changed. It would be naive to say Friday the Future hasn't reached anything. Um, yet if this is like, whether this is a start to, you know, or maybe a, a, a consequence of and a start and a, something to to the the social tipping points that we need to actually you know get started in a complete different level we will only see in a in some time we will only see it um looking back mm. yet i think what we can do is that what we know is that right now we are at a point that um you know um a lot of things a, a lot of doors are actually open and people around the world have seen uh, what kind of power power can grow from you know just some people organizing on the streets asking for climate action so mm. i think that is something that is truly powerful and um that was being made possible because people struggled before us and ideally that will you know be grow even bigger because you know people do whatever they want to do because they don't let themselves being mm. stopped by anything or anyone yeah mm. and, and if you look at this i mean 
I mean, what is the goal of the Friday for Future movement? Is it to reduce emissions? Is it to, I mean, what, what is our goal? And our goal is, of course, only to do as much as we possibly can. Um, so, so in that sense, we cannot fail. Mm. We cannot be unsuccessful because we, we only do as much as we can. And that needs, yeah. You cannot expect teenagers to, to change the world if you, if you if you see this and say like if you look at the emissions curve and, and your first thought is oh no the Fridays for Future movement have failed the teenagers have failed us then that's not I mean that's a very weird um, way of seeing it and also I mean we're here in the long run I mean we are not you know we're aware that this world you know that this isn't you know uh, that nothing is over but quite the opposite that um, this will, this is a, yeah, this is a large issue. And uh, once you decide to do everything you can, um, then, you know, you're, you're, you're in it. <laughs> so. um, I have a son who turned 18 last Sunday and I was, so it was a really small party. Uh, I was wondering how your birthday party, party was. So you turned 18 in the beginning of January. What did you do? Me? <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I didn't turn 18 in January. Well, maybe you didn't? You could have. <laughs> uh, well, to disappoint, I was uh, sick, so I was in quarantine alone with my dad. Oh, uh, no. I didn't speak to a single person and uh, I didn't celebrate my birthday actually. So, But okay. uh, I'm not a person who celebrates birthdays. So, okay. um, yeah. Um. And you're back to school as far as I got it and you're finishing um, um, school and I know you're asked this a lot, both of you. My last, last questions would nevertheless be, what will you do in four or five years? If you would have asked me that four or five years ago, I could have impossibly guessed where would we, where we would be now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I feel everything is possible and that is uh, scary and that's beautiful and that is the magic of what we do. So, um, yeah, somewhere, I suppose. Hmm. Greta, I hoped you, I'm a physicist, so I hoped you would become a physicist um, yourself. Yeah. What will you do? I have no idea. There's too much I want to do. The problem is not to find something I'm interested about. The problem is choosing. Um, and um, so, but I mean, yeah, I've, I've always been like a, a science nerd. So I really wanted to be, I, I imagined myself as a scientist working alone in a lab when I was younger. Um, but now it's, I, I thought like, okay, what's, what's needed now? Yes, we need more science. And we always, we will always need more science. But what we need more right now is action, political action be most useful. So that's why I chose to study civic sciences, but that may change. Um, it's, um, if it's one thing I've learned that it, nothing turns out the way you expected it to. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I will drop out. So maybe I will, I will start um, playing saxophone. Or I, I have no idea what I <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much for joining us, Greta. Thank you very much, Luisa. Thank you for the audience, for the great questions, the thousands of people following us. So have a great day and goodbye. Bye. Mm -hmm.